So I'll what I'll do is is I'll speak to you as though I'm uh, speaking to everybody. Yeah. Good afternoon and welcome to Action Coach uh, Lunch and Learn series of webinars. This Wednesday lunchtime, it's great to have you with us. We're broadcasting on Facebook and LinkedIn. So if you're listening to us on those platforms, please do comment, ask any questions in the stream in the comments box below. And we may have and we have got uh, visitors and people logged into Zoom, which is also great. So if you're on the Zoom, please do put any questions in the Q&A box. That's great as well. But I'm really pleased to have Zach Fairbanks from uh, Wellbeing in your office with us today. Hi, Zach. How are you? I'm good. Thanks, Stephen. And thanks very much for inviting me. Really nice to be here. It's great to have you with us. And we're going to be talking all about well-being in the workplace, in your office, as your as your business suggests, Zach, which is mm. great. And we're going to be talking a bit about how to overwhelm stress and uh, how to improve our focus and incorporate mindfulness at work and in our lives generally. I, I say it's probably reaches far beyond the, the office doors at the beginning and end of the day. But, uh, you know, helping us to, to really have that laser focus day in day out but before we get into that Zach tell us a bit about you and the organization what what is well-being in your office all about on a day-to-day -day basis sure well well-being in your office um, we offer um, mind body and diet uh, services uh, through our team of specialists so we have a team of nutritionists team of mindfulness teachers yoga teachers and first aid for mental health um, teachers as well and um, we recognized um, through my partner and I, Gosha, who teaches yoga, we both recognized that there was a, a need for well-being to be improved in the workplace. So many of us are kind of suffering with anxiety and stress of one form or another, and people are burning out all over the place. So we felt that we could bring these services into the workplace and we can, there's loads mm -hmm. of clinical research that shows the effect and the positive effect that uh, these things have on people. So that's what we do. Brilliant. Well, it's, I'm really looking forward to everything you've got to, to share with us today. And it, it's fair to say, Zach, isn't it, that the last, uh, the last 18 months <laughs> with this little word here has really added to that, uh, that sense of overwhelm, that stress, that anxiety that we have all been facing. And in, in fact, I, I was in a meeting, not work-related, as a trustee with an organisation the other day, and we were talking about this ticking time bomb of, of mental health and wellbeing that I still think is still to play out. So it's really important that we find ways to support and look after each other uh, and uh, you may well be familiar with this I, I've used it in a number of my workshops and webinars uh, and masterclasses over the last 18 months Zach it's that change process isn't it and it, it we all deal with it in a really different way don't we we do we do and, and you're absolutely right just go back to your previous slide about the lockdown um, we'll, we'll be touching on a small exercise that we can get everyone to do that's watching um, in within the presentation um, about how lockdown has affected us really but uh, it's not just lockdown you know there's lots of things um that affect us um in just when we're in kind of normal times let's say that we need to address mm -hmm. and i think one of the things i've i've certainly learned myself what over the last 18 months is is to plan for and expect change and, and i haven't got i mean i could do a whole webinar we could do a whole webinar just on this one side couldn't we but you know um, i remember driving up and down to Birmingham just as lockdown the first time and was about to happen and people were saying well why aren't they closing the schools why aren't they closing the workplace and of course when that happened you know, that, there was that real sense of overwhelm but what I, I've learned more than anything is not to become complacent now is to expect change going forwards and if we can plan for change and expect change it'll help us I'm sure you'll you'll, you'll touch on that uh, and also just to reach out for our, our colleagues and, and those inside the workplace and those outside and um, you know another thing I, I've reflected on over the last 18 months is we all are very good at saying i'm fine zach when you ask me a question you know are you okay yes i'm fine everything's great but underneath the surface if we dig just a little bit deeper everything might not be quite as we're portraying it to be and i think that's that's what we really need to look out for and, and, and sort of looking forward to how you can uh, what you've got to share in terms of helping us understand both looking after ourselves and looking after others so i know you've got some slides to share zach so i'll, I'll pass the, the reins over to you Okay. And um, but it, it just on the on your question here, it's absolutely we, we're very good at asking the question, aren't we? But we're very poor at answering it, honestly. Um, and that's one thing we need to be is just be be uh, confident to be a bit more honest about how you're actually doing. You know, there's there's nothing yes. wrong with being honest about it. But yeah, I'll, absolutely. Uh, it's, okay, it's okay to not be okay, isn't it? And there's, there's times when I've heard that question being asked. This is your loading up slides, and and people have hardly taken a breath for somebody to give the answer. And they've moved the conversation on. It's almost mm. like it's a courtesy question rather than a real intent to, to find out how somebody is. That's right. But, uh, that's right. Yeah. So it's okay to but, say, it's okay to admit it, but uh, yeah. Good so, stuff. 
Okay, so, uh, overwhelm is a word I've heard a lot over the last twelve months or so, Zach. So no, let's uh, hear what you've got to say. We'll, we'll touch on it in these slides. So I've got a similar slide to the one that you showed uh, with your roller coaster, um, roller coaster of kind of well-being and overwhelm. Mm. So um, this is mindfulness for focus and resilience. So just for yourself, um, Stephen, and, and not just for yourself, but everybody that's watching, if you uh, if you're sitting in a chair, if you can make sure you're sitting sort of fairly upright. Um, and hopefully your phones are off. Can you turn your phone off or, or put it on silent um, so we can be fully focused on what we're doing? Um, and if you've got something to write on, that'd be great. A piece of paper and a pen is what you'll need for this session. So uh, please grab okay. those guys when you're watching. Okay. So my question to you is, are you still dancing? <laughs> are you still having fun? It's a metaphor for activities that nourish you that lift your mood and give you energy and uh, make you calm and centered. And these can be lots of things. These can be visiting family and friends, can't they? Gigs, whatever your interests are, picnics, a cup of coffee, going to the shops, hobbies, hairdressing, going to the gym maybe. Maybe it's going to restaurants or a cinema or seeing a film. Uh, holidays, day trips, reading and walking. There's so many things, aren't mm. there, in, in our lives that we can mm. consider nourishing. So, and I guess that just just thinking on that that question, actually, one of the, the challenges for us all over the last sort of uh, eighteen months, fifteen months, is a lot of the things you've just mentioned there. You know, spending time with friends and family, going out to places, doing things, other things that have been taken away from us. That's right. And that's been one of the biggest challenges, hasn't it, over the last eighteen months or so? That's absolutely right. And lockdown has, has really just reduced this, hasn't it? And we're just starting to come out of it again now, and uh, hopefully start to enjoy some of those things that nourished us mm. but even without lockdown you know even without them we can restart to reduce these activities especially when we become really busy um, and that's often from work or maybe you're parenting maybe you're looking after a sick loved one or maybe you're doing all three of those um, and then when we get stressed about whatever one or which one that is we can start to focus in on that stress and suddenly those nourishing activities start to film a bit more optional and we start to trim them away don't we so you might be thinking oh, oh you know i'm going to get on top of work over the next few months and maybe i won't go to my yoga class or maybe i won't book that holiday yet because i need to get ahead in work or maybe you're looking after a sick parent and maybe you've cut everything off just because you think you should be with them as much as you can. So this is called the exhaustion funnel. And uh, it's uh, been designed by a lady called Professor Marie Asperger. And she's an expert on overwhelm and exhaustion. And at the top is your life with your balanced life, with hobbies and exercise and um, out of pandemic time. That's kind of what it would look like, chores, cooking, social life all these kinds of things but then as i said what tends to happen when we start to become stressed and we know that stress in short bursts can be very useful for us it can make us very focused but it's the long-term stress that's a problem the constant stress that we put ourselves under that causes mm -hmm. severe physical and mental issues and conditions that can be quite catastrophic in the end so what is this funnel well as we start to trim away our balanced life with all these nourishing things, we start to move down this spiral. So maybe we'll have some sleep problems in, in the beginning. Maybe we'll you know, find it difficult to get to sleep or start waking up in the night. Maybe we'll start losing energy during the day and just feeling a kind of lack of energy, a lack of vibrance. And aches and pains, we start to feel more pain in the body. The body starts to talk to us. It starts to send us messages of uh, how much stress we're under. Eventual guilt, joylessness, and then depression, and then your exhaustion. And that can be wiping people out for up to years, let alone weeks. You know, So it can be quite something. So in order to kind of get ourselves out of this, we need to develop these nourishing activities. But I suppose the question is, is what... What are they doing for us, these nourishing activities? What are they actually doing for us? 
And in essence, they're developing resilience. We hear about this word, don't we, resilience a lot. Have you, are you resilient? You know, can you develop your resilience? And often I think people use this word, but don't really know how to develop it. They just think it's something they've either got or they haven't. So if we've agreed that all these nourishing activities, you know, that great weekend you had and how it kind of gave you some distance between you and that worry you had at work, we've all probably experienced that. We know nourishing activities will develop our resilience. That energy that wonderful things that we do give us just helps us kind of face some of the struggles that we've got in our life. So if we accept that, if we accept that part of our way of developing our resilience, our way of coping with the stresses that we've got in our lives is about nourishing ourselves, can we have a look at our day perhaps? Can we have a look at our day and see, are we actually doing enough nourishing our things during our day and during our evening and during our weekend to make sure we're topping up that bank account, let's say, of energy that we need to get through our life? So what I'd like you to do is a really simple exercise. So if you write down on the left of a page your activities during a day, And start, start in the morning and whatever that morning looks like. And then you work into work and, and then into your evening. It'll look like something like this. And then by the right-hand side, you write an N or a D. N being nourishing, lifts your mood, gives you energy and keeps you calm and centered. And depleting, the D, something that saps your energy and creates tension perhaps or worry and anxiety. And if you're not sure, maybe it's neutral, just put an N and N stroke D. Maybe one of your tasks does both. So just write it down twice. So just spend a you few want minutes. Our listeners to do this now, do you, Zach? Is that? Uh... Yeah, do it now, guys. You know, you're watching. Okay. I can't see you. So, um, but this is a really, really useful exercise because you really see how you're looking at your day. Not only that, but also how much nourishment you're giving yourself. We use the analogy, and you've no doubt heard it, of um, putting your own oxygen mask on first. When we're, when we're flying, we get told if there's low pressure or reduced oxygen that we have to attend to ourselves first before helping others. Otherwise, we just get into a mess, don't we? We lose oxygen and we start affecting somebody else and it just becomes a mess. Mm. So it's the same in our lives. We, we must attend to ourselves. We must nourish ourselves with activities that give us energy so we can best attend then to the stresses of work and parenting and looking after sick mm. loved ones. It just, just, I've got a comment just while he's on the, on the screen. I've got a comment from Sue, man. So thank you for your your comments are interesting. Some of these things could start out as being nourishing, but as you get to do have to do more and more of them, they can become depleting. Is that fair to say, Zach? Yeah, yeah. So put that down twice. Put it down that you know you might be focusing on something and it might become nourishing, and then put it down as, as depleting as well. Because we'll have a little talk around this as well. So I'll be I'll be talking about this kind of idea and how we can look at this. So mm. it's a good point. So let's. Uh, We'll get, we'll get, we'll use you as the guide, Stephen, because I can't see the rest of the guys. So when you're done, then I'll, I'll take that as everyone else's. Yes, no, please do. Well, I've, I've got a list here that I'm happy to, to go through when you're ready. Well, that's okay. That's uh, the first question is what does it look like? What does your list look like in terms of nourishing and depleting? And obviously, it's not a finite science. You know, the depleting could be massively depleting and you might have four or five very small nourishings. But on a general view, how would you say your list looks? Um, I'd say it's probably a 60-40 split with 60 being nourishing, 40 what our class is depleting. Okay, okay. Do you think, is there anything nourishing, especially now we're coming out of lockdown? Because uh, obviously a lot of those, as we discussed, those activities were taken away. Is there anything, do you think you can add? Is there anything maybe that you used to do that um, you can get back into? Yes, I, I think certainly as the restrictions start to ease, you know, sort of getting out a bit more in the evenings, seeing friends, 
few more activities that perhaps as things start to open up organizations I was involved with or could be reinvolved with so you know so just so my free time instead of spending it just in the evening at home could be absolutely going out and seeing doing things with people and seeing other people I think you know even just a visit down to the pub to have a pint you know mm. exactly. <laughs> so I'm sure it's as, it's, as, it's as, it's as simple as that it's yeah, so going, or going to pictures, you know, going to the cinema, those sort of things. I'm sure as restrictions start to ease, will will build up the 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 uh, nourishing list of activities. Right, because we're in a habit, aren't we, at the moment of staying in because that's what we've been told to do for a year. So that's yes, a habit. Indeed. So we now have to kind of consciously think about breaking that habit. We now have to consciously think about wanting to go to the cinema or go and see a friend because it's no longer part of our normal day to day. So this is why we have to break these habits of staying in or not doing some of the nourishing activities we used to do by actually thinking, what can I do? And actively doing them because it will benefit you. It will benefit your resilience in times of stress. And it is a stressful time, no doubt about it. Okay, so- Yes, and, and just picking up on, on, on Suman's comment about if, if you do seeing too much, it can be more depleting than nourishing. I think there's, there's certainly things on my list that, that you know, for example, preparing presentations in PowerPoint in short bursts would be fine. It's when I've got long power. If I do too much of the same thing, it can become quite a, an onerous task. And that's right. And that's why frequent breaks are required when we're doing any kind of task. And we mm. need to be able to check in. And we'll talk a bit about checking in later in the presentation about how we can do that. But um, and talking about kind of doing mode just after this as well, why we need to take frequent breaks in order to pace ourselves because it's it's dramatically important but let's have a quick look at our activities because we have some depleting ones everyone's got some depleting ones on their list can we be more mindful perhaps of the ones of those activities that we already do because i'm sure some people out there watching this going i don't have time i don't have time to do any more in my life it's already busy i can't add more nourishing activities and that's a fair point. You know, many of us might be thinking that. So the question is, is on your list, perhaps, of depleting activities, can we be more mindful of some? And that leads us to the question, what does that mean then to be more mindful? What does it mean to be more mindful of activities that are depleting? So I'm going to tell you a story. And then you can have a look at your depleting activities. Yeah, so love I, it's to be on and learn, Zach. <laughs> I used to, uh, I still do rather, I um, folding my daughter's laundry and putting it in her, in her drawers. She's three years old, so she can't do it yet. You know, we'll work on that to get her trained. Up. And um, I used to just throw it in any old how, because it used to really frustrate me putting laund laundry away. And um, the feeling was that I, I, I want to just get this done so I can perhaps get to doing something more productive or more useful or more nourishing. And then later in the week when I need to get clothes for her and maybe every day I'll be getting clothes for her with my partner that I couldn't quite find what I needed to, to get for her because they're all just kind of a bit of a mess and put on top of each other. So it used to frustrate me. And then I realized that I really wasn't being mindful about this process at all. And in fact, it had I been mindful and that's what I chose to become was I brought more attention to it by folding the clothes properly spending a bit of time putting them neatly in the, in the in the drawers and by doing it and by bringing full attention to it instead of being a depleting activity where it was frustrating me not only at the point but at the point I couldn't find the clothes it now became slightly nourishing I'd achieved something I'd done something I brought attention to it I became present for it and that's one of the key aspects of mindfulness is becoming present for what you're doing becoming focused in what you're doing so can we bring a bring is, is there anything on your list perhaps that's that you think's depleting maybe like laundry or something like that but actually you could go can i treat this as a mindful exercise can i treat this as an exercise in becoming present becoming focused well i'm, I'm sure there's things on my list and i, I I, I ironically I have laundry on my on my list and there's a basket of laundry waiting to be hung up outside as I sit here with you now cleaning is another one you know sort of a, I think you know could become more mindful about it and sort of you know approaching a different way it could be a certainly a more nourishing activity I'm sure 
That's right. So what we're trying to do is reframe our depleting activities, maybe not all of them. And maybe I'm not suggesting that you're going to love cleaning from, from tomorrow um, or later today, whenever you start it. But certainly if you, if you can think about it as this is a practice in becoming focused, this is a practice in becoming present for what I'm doing. And actually, I'm going to treat it just as I treat some of the other things that I do in my life. I'm going to do it properly. I'm going to do it with good effect. And that way, you're doing this with a much more relaxed frame of mind, with less tension, with better focus, and you're practicing becoming fully present. And that's what we're trying to achieve here. That's what mindfulness is trying to achieve, is to help you become present in everything you do. So that's kind of the part about how therefore we can even improve our resilience by some of the depleting things that we do by just reframing them by actually coming to the present moment with them mm. okay and i guess it, it i say you know we, we can all too easily sort of sit there and, and dwell on the past and that will stop us from moving forward to what is that but also if we start thinking about the future all the time we're just daydreaming it's about as you say being very present in the moment is so key isn't it in terms of being able to move things forward and, and, and have an impact well that's on, right on, we call in mindfulness we call it pre-living and past living so if we're sort of ruminating about the past with lots of regrets and we're kind of worrying and wishing we'd done this wishing we'd done that better then we're literally trying to place ourselves in the past and that'll bring our mood down and that's often uh, where depression and low mood comes from it's certainly not going to make you focus because you're focused somewhere else in another time Likewise, if we start to worry too much about the future, if we start to become perhaps a little overwhelmed by what the future holds, we will get anxious, we will get worried because we're trying to be somewhere we're not yet, because the place we are is here right now in the present moment. So the more we practice becoming present is the more we've got a better chance of not only being more resilient because we're not affected by those stresses of worry or depression, but we'll be better focused in what we're doing in the job in hand. So that's, that's the key element of, of, uh, of mindfulness. The other part of mindfulness that people often ask questions about is, can I still plan? Can I still plan? You know, can I think about the future? Is that allowed in mindfulness? Of course it is. Um, the activity you may be doing right now is planning for the future. That's still a mind. You can still pr approach that mindfully because you're bringing full attention to it. But once you've done your plan, and the next thing you're going to do may be something else, your PowerPoint presentation, bring attention to that. So was, uh, there was a coach I had a couple of years ago, Zach always used to say to me, create everything twice, once in your mind and once in reality. Um, but it's about, you know, once you've planned it in your mind, then get back to the reality of doing it and, you know, making it happen. Yeah. Quite often during our day, we will, uh, we will practice not being mindful because of the automatic pilot we run on. And I'll quickly, I wasn't going to touch on this, but I'll do it now because it kind of leads in nicely. But automatic pilot is that thing that we use when we drive a car. We, we wouldn't be able to drive a car without this wonderful adaptation and development that humans have to be able to program our mind. And then our minds then can start be thinking of something else in our conscious awareness. Mm -hmm. But it comes with a problem because we can then autopilot most of our lives, can't we? You know, how often have we autopiloted the whole of a morning, perhaps? Getting up, getting dressed, showering at some point, getting breakfast, maybe ironing a shirt, leaving the house, getting in a car. How often have you perhaps forgotten about whether or not you closed or locked the door, you know? Ask yourself, did I lock the door? I can't remember if I locked yeah. the door. Did I, did I, I was I... thinking that might be my age, that, but uh, I do often wonder whether I have actually locked the front door enough at times. <laughs> yeah. So it's because you're not present for locking the door, because your mind's mm. gone to the car or wherever it's gone. And we, we all do it because if we do these tasks every day, so they become automatic pilot, so we can let go of them. But the problem is, is that if we do that, and bear in mind, this is most of your life your morning and the things that you do, perhaps driving to work when we used to, and perhaps that's opening up a bit more now, but this is most of your life and you're not present for it. We're not present for most of our lives. So if you agree that life is really enjoyed and lived in the present moment when you're fully present for it, then we really ought to start being present for more of our life. It's quite simple, isn't it? 
I'm not suggesting that perhaps you're going to love brushing your teeth or love closing the door. By, by practicing being more present for it, you'll then end up unconsciously being present for more of your life. So my suggestion to people listening into this and, and watching this is have a think about what you do in your morning that you could become more present for. Maybe your shower, maybe making your bed. Use these opportunities to practice being present because the more we practice being present, the more, the more present we'll be unconsciously. At the moment, most of us are being unpresent and we're practicing that. So we're doing a great job of not being present for our lives. So we need to kind of create a new habit now, which is being present for our lives, even in the small things, because the small things, they're not really small. They're the big things. They create the bigger picture, which is being present for all of your life. So that's a bit about automatic pilot. And that's a little bit about how we can combat that. If you're having a shower tomorrow, can you perhaps use your senses? Because it's all very well me saying, can you be more mindful? But how do you do it? Is the question, isn't it? How do you actually become more mindful? But it's simply, we use tricks. We use small tricks. We use our senses to give us that idea or give us the input of what's going on in the present moment. So that might be, if you're in a shower, you might use your smell. What does your soap smell like? I mean, what does it really smell like? Can you really bring it to your nose and maybe mm. notice some of the citrus fruits that are in it? It sounds crazy, doesn't it? Why am I smelling soap in a shower, you might be thinking. All these judgments come up when we start talking about mindfulness. But it's important because it's we're using... Go on, say we, are, we often choose a bar of soap in the supermarket by smelling it as we you know, select it off the shelf. But that might be the one and only time we do smell the soap and it's it, it, absolutely right. It's about taking that time, isn't it? And just, you know, being in the moment. Mm. So that for, therefore using our smell, our sense of smell as a yeah. way to become present. And mm. then we use it uh, the more that, and we also then stretch out what we're doing. We stretch out our shower in terms of our experience of it. What does the water feel like on your skin? I mean, what does it really feel like? What are the sensations it sends around your body when, the shower or the water hits your body for the first time notice that and all these things we start to notice we consciously starting to notice means we start to practice being present for what we're doing and therefore when we do that in more of our life when we're unconscious as in unconsciously doing we'll be more present for what we're doing and that's the idea of mindfulness to practice being present so we become unconsciously present for more of our life and that might be on holiday. It could be work. You'll be better focused. And also you'll be better placed for dealing with relationships. So your stress, you'll notice your stress more. And that's a big part of mindfulness, noticing how we are internally as well. So quickly on doing mode and being mode, which is what the slides have here. So there's two, we, we talk about this in mindfulness, about doing mode. And doing mode is... is, is uh, as it sounds, everything we're kind of doing really. You know, it's checklists, it's strategizing, it's critical thinking, multitasking. We're really good at that. We do that all the time. In our heads, we're always thinking about things or actually doing things. We're doing these PowerPoint presentations of things. The being mode, this is the bit where we're, we're consciously pausing, slowing down, focusing on the present moment, checking in, how am I doing? throughout your day we'll talk about checking in in a while and also noticing your thoughts and feelings noticing what's coming up for you noticing how you are you got any questions a comment today? from from claire zach um, mm -hmm. on Facebook. just uh, saying trying to get the balance right between pressure of having to achieve certain tasks in the day versus the time needed to, to sort of be and slow down Yep. How would you go about balancing that out? So if you were in a gym and you wanted to complete your session and you had a worked out session of a bit of running and you're going to do some weights and you're going to do all these kinds of things at a gym, are you going to go and do it without stopping and pausing? Are you just going to, we wouldn't, would we? We know that. We, we, we know that when, if we're doing a set of weights, for example, we're going to pause after each one, let our muscles 
come back. So, we, and we know that because we've got quite a lot of physical sensations that come from our muscles to say that they're tired. Well, the brain is very similar. The brain uses the most energy of any organ in the body and it gets tired. So simply by checking in with ourselves throughout the day, and by checking in, I mean taking maybe just 60 seconds to pause, shut your eyes, and just focus in on your breath because it's present, and notice what's coming up in your mind. So you'll notice this because what will probably happen is some of the consequences of what you've done from your day will start to rear in your head. So everything you do, Stephen, and people watching uh, wherever you are on Facebook, everything you've sent out this morning before this session, there'll be a consequence to. Each email is a consequence, isn't there? You know, you send it to someone, a client, and you know in your back of your head there might be some workings that are going on to say, oh, I wonder what they'll think about that. I wonder, I wonder if they'll like that proposal. Yeah? We all know these. But if we don't, if we're not aware of them and we just send email after email, have a Zoom meeting after Zoom meeting, have a face-to-face -face meeting after face meeting, a call, a PowerPoint presentation, and we don't stop to check in, all this will start to accumulate. It all starts to accumulate. And the problem is then, is that your body will then start giving you ideas and messages through headaches, through shoulder pain, through all these things to say, hey, I need you to stop because I need you to process this. I need to be walked through the consequences of your actions. So checking in maybe four or five times in a day for 60 seconds, listening into your breath, noticing the thoughts that are coming up, walking yourself through them. Maybe there's a worry that came up that you didn't even think about when you sent that email. Walk your mind through it. Say, hey, it's, no, it's gonna be fine. This is gonna happen, this is gonna happen. What's next? No, we're good. And then start again. So just like you would in a gym, you're gonna pace yourself so you can last your day and be the best you can throughout your day. Now, from my perspective, I'd say, hey, work an eight hour day and don't work more than eight hours, but nobody's gonna do that. So it's better than if you're gonna be working these really long, long days is pace yourself through the day. You owe it mm -hmm. to yourself to do that, to take a proper break to make sure that when you're on your break, you're doing just that and not bringing your phone with you and thinking it's okay. So that's the kind of thing I would do. No, great advice. And I, I love that check in four times a day, 60 seconds. I mean, uh, I don't think there's a single person on this call on this webinar or that we know that hasn't got, you know, four minutes in a day just oh. to check in, just check where they are. And set your alarm yourself. when you do it. So set your alarm mm -hmm. and, and I do it on my, my, my iPhone. Um, and I just put my alarm in to do a three minute meditation four times a day. And uh, I might have to snooze it. I might be on a call or something, but Hey, it's reminded me and I can just snooze it throughout the call. Mm. And then when I come off, I can go straight into it. And, and believe me, it's a game changer. Um, so I wanted to talk a bit about you off, uh, it might take you off track in terms of what you want to share today. Uh, Zach, but Paul is just asking about apps and you know, in terms of helping with mindfulness. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that's something you want to touch on today or whether you later on, but are, are there apps that would help with that? You talked talk about setting your alarm on your phone. Is it as simple as that? Um, app, apps can be useful. Um, if you want to learn more about mindfulness, then I would suggest coming to a class because mindfulness is best practiced with other people. Um, mm -hmm. Apps can tend to kind of make you a bit isolated with what you're doing. But having said that, if you know how to meditate, then, then yeah, go for it. Um, there are a lot of meditations on YouTube to use. So, you know, there, there are those that can be just downloaded and played. Um, the important part of meditation is to remember that you're not trying to stop thinking. It's, it's not about stopping thinking. It's about being aware of your thoughts. Um, you can't stop thinking. It, 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 it's impossible until you're, yes. until you're <laughs> dead. Um, that's the only time you'll probably stop. So, yeah, this, it's all about and making sure that we're, what we're trying to cultivate is an idea of the self observing the thoughts. That's what we're trying to do. And by observing thoughts, therefore, we can then make better decisions upon those thoughts that we've had. But yeah, thumbs up for apps. But if you are interested in mindfulness and more meditation, get to some classes because it, mindfulness is much better practice with other people. Brilliant. Thank you for that. Is that no problem. So I wanted to quickly talk about um, multitasking. Um, 
because it is prevalent and we're all kind of guilty of it and some i'm still guilty of it and i teach people Absolutely. to try and reduce it we can't always help um doing multitasking so i just going to ask you uh Stephen, and, and obviously the people at home there's a picture in front of you of a guy juggling and what is this guy about to do well, there's three things going on there. It looks to me like he's, he's, his mind is probably listening, well, he's, half his mind is listening to his music. He's then looking at the balls and juggling them while he's probably about to cross the road. Mm. That's pretty much it, isn't it, really? So um, it's a pretty dangerous thing he's about to do, isn't it, cross a road? Yeah. There's traffic yeah. coming and he's juggling and he's listening to stuff on, on his headphones. So in a work context, the road is important work let's say it's you're focusing in on a, a contract for a client let's say and it has the detail has to be really right you know and this has to be you know this is a big deal for your business and what you're doing the balls that are being juggled are distractions you know their phone notifications their social media their musical television their conversation with someone in the background um, it's a zoom meeting perhaps what you're having while you're doing something else maybe you're eating maybe you're having a having your lunch while you're doing this project but these are all the things that we're juggling you know there are other juggles that we're going on inside our mind claire claire just made a comment on on, on linkedin zach that uh, working from home and online has made us all experts in multitasking <laughs> and i guess there will be people listening to us today who are indeed doing emails and, and various other tasks on the computer at the same time that's right. And, 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 the, and yeah, experts on multitasking, that, that's a bit of a problematic area because um, we're not designed to multitask. That's, that's the problem. Humans aren't designed to do it. Um, here's some research. So if you're a heavy multitasker, you're going to be worse than other people at doing a single task. So if you then want a single task, you're not going to be as good at it. And you're going to be 40% less productive when you multitask. Um, it's we're it's we're really poor at it as humans, and um, we can only kind of hold in our mind a, only a certain amount of data. Just like a computer can only handle a certain amount of data at any one time before it starts to kind of shut down or make mistakes. Mm -hmm. So we have a kind of obligation to ourselves to try and reduce, and we can easily reduce quite a lot of multitasking, even if we're going to be multitasking a little bit because we can't. We can't always avoid it, and I, and I completely accept that. So what does it look like, first of all, before we can start to tackle it? So doing two or more things at the same time is the obvious answer, isn't it? But it's eating, oops, today, is it? <laughs> Let's just come out again. I've obviously put a nice... Uh... So having a conversation whilst writing an email, having multiple spreadsheets open, having multiple browsers open, checking social media, uh, ruminating or anxious thoughts. So that's also multitasking, you know? Mm -hmm. are, we, are we worried about something? Is it distracting us? Is that thing distracting us from what we're doing? We all get that, don't we? And that's a great time to meditate, is to meditate on that point and try and get to the bottom of that point and walk ourselves through it. That's where meditation becomes really helpful. But the other things are kind of quite more sort of physical things, let's say, in, a, in our environment that we can deal with, can't we? I, I had a record once. I think I had 57 Excel spreadsheets open about six mm -hmm. years ago. I remember, I remember shutting them all down at the end of my day. In some way, I'm connected to all of them. It's exhausting when you think about it, isn't it? My brain's connected to all of those sheets in some very small way. It's distracted by everything that's open because I've opened and looked at it. So my advice in, is... In many workplaces now, Zach, I, I've seen over the last couple of years, in, in, more than ever, you know, many people, people have got sort of multiple screens. I mean, I'm, I'm guilty of it here. I've got two screens open as I sit and talk to you. And I think many workplaces now, they sort of, the standard is two screens so you can do that multitasking on a daily basis. Um, well, you'll, you'll make more mistakes doing that. That's, that's my, uh, yes, my, yes. my uh, guarantee on it. It, it. it is just about, it's doing the simple stuff first, though, not, not trying to necessarily change massively how you're currently working in terms of if you've got two screens. You may need them, and you may need to bounce from one to the other, and that just may be how you work. But at least can you perhaps turn your phone notifications off? 
because you're completely linked to your phone if you've got notifications going off for all your social media. Mm. And even when they're not going off, the research and the data and, and the evidence suggests that we're very much connected to them. There was, a, um, there was a, an experiment done on, on, on a group of students from the same class and they split the students in half, not literally, obviously, just the class. And they asked them to put their, to, all of them to turn their phones off. And half the students then put their phones in their bag in another room. And the other half just put their phones in the bag underneath the seat or underneath the desk that they were working at. And they set, themselves, they set them all the same test. And there was a dramatic difference between the results of the students that had their phone in another room versus who had their phone underneath their desk. And the point of the research shows that even when your phone's off and it's next to you, it's distracting you. Mm -hmm. So that's how much we get connected to things. So that's my, uh, that's my advice on this is, is try and reduce the number of browsers open on your, on your browser. Can you just reduce them down? It will just help. And then you'll have more energy for your brain throughout the day. So how do we ta tackle it? It's firstly becoming aware that you're multitasking. That's the first thing, isn't it? Be becoming aware that first of all, that multitasking is an issue. Not everyone thinks it's an issue. Everyone thinks, oh, I'm just being productive. But we've seen some of the, the data from it that we're not. Mm. Um, and as I mentioned, closing down the browsers and reducing notifications, etc. So checking in. So I mentioned checking in earlier and we had a quick chat about checking in. Somebody asked a question about checking in. Why do, we, uh, why do we need to check in? Why do we need to do this? Well, we need to understand our needs. We need to, as I mentioned earlier, we need to reflect on what we've done and its consequences. So practicing being present for how we are can enable us to tune into our emotional state, our worries and our stresses. And then we can then choose how to act rather than reacting perhaps which is what we often do when we get stressed, we end up being more reactive, which is not very good when we're working with people or at home with people or our clients. And the practice of checking in is essentially like a meditation. It's essentially taking those 60 seconds to just follow our breath and see what comes up and asking ourselves, how am I doing right now? A quick story for you. So I'm driving in my car and I've got some music blaring out, some rock music. I'm partial to a bit of rock music, Stephen. So I've got this music <laughs> blaring out in my car and I'm coming up just on the motorway behind a, a truck that's moving slower than me. So I drop down into third, I overtake the truck, I'm listening to the music still and I pull in and the music's going on for about five minutes and then the music stops, it's on the radio. And when the music stops, I hear this, real kind of high pitched sound coming from my engine. And I realize I haven't changed gear. I'm still in third gear, traveling at 70 miles an hour. Wow. <laughs> and in order in a manual car, if you have a manual car, to know that you need to change gear, you need to be able to hear the slightly overdriven sound of the engine to be able to know that that's the point to change gear. So using this analogy, it's kind of like work is the radio blaring, that's our distraction, yeah? We can't hear how we are, we can't listen into how we are because we're doing so much work. So this checking in business is about stopping and listening to our engine. Am I overdriven? Do I need to stop? Do I need to pause? And we know this happens, don't we? Because how often um, do we come off Zoom calls and suddenly go, oh, I'm hungry. God, I'm so hungry, I need the loo. God, I need the loo, I didn't realize I needed the loo. How, how easily we can switch off from some of the most powerful sensations in our body, which is toilet and, and hunger. Mm -hmm. So there are much more subtle messages our body gives us as well. I mean, we could be sat here on, a, on this Zoom call and come up afterwards and go, oh, I was sat in an awkward position, I've got to stretch. We're not fully present necessarily for actually how we are during the session. Mm -hmm. So it's really important that during our day, going back to checking in, that we do that so we just know physically how am I doing? Do I need to get up and walk around? Do I need to move a bit? Am I getting into a stressful position for my neck and my shoulders and my, any part of my body? But also in terms of our emotional state, how am I doing? 
that? Can I listen to something? Am I getting worried about something? What can I do about it? And then, as I said before, we can walk ourselves through it. Mm -hmm. That's a bit about checking in. So can you just close your eyes and focus on your breath? Which we talked about setting reminders. And before you start your work, while your computer's booting up, can you maybe, instead of doing your to-do list, can you use that as an opportunity just to check in? So in summary, nourishing activities develop resilience. So can you reframe, reframe rather depleting ones by using them as a mindful practice? Reduce your multitasking. It will improve your focus and your productivity. Checking in helps us process, improve energy and reduce stress and anxiety. And silent meditation is clinically proven to help focus and resilience. Even one minute a day will help. And consider mindfulness and this way of being I don't even have to call it mindfulness, just this way of being in your work as part of your CPD. We all, we're all here learning how to be better at work, how to be better in our jobs, in our businesses. But that also means we need to be better at looking after ourselves, how to look after our mental health. Because ultimately, it will pay you back. It's a full investment into your business. And the final point is that everyone needs to take care of their mental health not just those that have a mental health issue. Everybody, each one of us must look after our own mental health. I, I love that last comment there, uh, Zach, about being an investment. You know, we, I talk to many of my clients week in, week out about, you know, building their business, investing in the business. But to do that, we need to invest in ourselves. And there's a great coach uh, called Jim Rowan, no longer with us, a number of years ago and passed away, but he, he always talked about working harder on yourself than you do on your job. And I think it's so true, isn't it? We need to check in with ourselves and just make sure we work as hard on ourselves as we do on our job. You know, think about looking after ourselves, checking in, you know, some of the things you said, this, this lunch and learn, um, you know, about just those four, four times a day, you know, just close your eyes before you start work in the morning, thinking about your body, thinking about who you are, where you are, how you're feeling, uh, whether you're hungry or not. And, and by just addressing some of those, we can make such a difference to our productivity, can't we? Mm, absolutely right. Absolutely right. And I, I think it's, it, it's, it's of key importance. It's, and, and the working hard on ourselves is not about us working harder. It's actually sometimes recognising that we need to slow down. We need to pause because we're not, we can't sprint through life and, and be and, and make that a success because we will just burn out you know we have to pace ourselves we have to be disciplined in stopping and pausing because it is a discipline we're very much in the in the in, in the way of working of just doing 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 all the time even when we're sat still having a sandwich we're doing in our minds rather than eating the sandwich or going for your walk is are you thinking about work when you're going for your walk or can you try and recognize you're thinking about work and then come back to your walk by using your senses by smelling seeing hearing tasting feeling and in that way you're working on yourself properly and that's the key part i'll leave you with this quote this is uh, from william george board member of goldman sachs the main business case for meditation is that you're fully present on the job you'll be more effective as a leader you'll make better decisions and you'll work better with other people. It's a great summary. Yeah, yeah. I think it's a great, great point to make. And I, I, and I just wrote down, as you were saying earlier on, uh, Zach, about being 40% less effective by multitasking. I think certainly, you know, thinking about myself now, I've learned so much from just listening to you over the last 45 minutes in terms of, you know, how I undertake my day in terms of nourishing activities and depleting activities. I'm going to go away and address that. And I hope our, our listeners will reflect on that as well. But, but I do know I have become an expert in the last 12 months on multitasking, you know, sitting there on a Zoom call whilst also doing something else or having several screens up and doing several tasks at the same time. And I think it's a certainly a wake up call to use the wrong phrase, maybe but a you know, a point in which we can just take stock and think Well, I can take stock and think about what, what can I do differently to, to make sure I'm looking after myself and being my the, the best I can be the, be, the best version of me in every task that I take on every single day. And I think that's a, certainly something I... I have taken away from from your your input this lunchtime, Zach. It's been really really helpful. Great, great. Well, if you've got time, Stephen, um, we've got ten minutes. So, um, are you happy to do a meditation um, and then a, absolutely? Um, let's let's do that. Any questions? 
All right, brilliant. So I'm going to ask you and everybody who's watching, again, if you can get your phones out of sight. Um, I'm sure some sneaky people have got their phones still on. Um, <laughs> and um, come to an upright sitting position. That's right. And with your feet flat on the floor, hopefully uncrossed. And your hands just resting on your lap. And if you're comfortable, just bring your eyes to a close. And just start to be aware of uh, how the seat feels. How does it feel to sit in your seat? Just notice that. Notice the support of the floor for your legs and feet. And now start to notice your breathing. Not trying to change the pace or depth in any way. Just noticing how it is right now. And maybe there's an area in your body where you particularly notice it. Maybe you notice the rise and the fall of your abdomen or your chest. Maybe it's the cool air entering your nostrils and the warm air leaving. Wherever it is, just bring your attention and awareness to that. And while we do this short meditation, your mind will wonder. And that's okay. This is the purpose of meditation. And when you notice that your mind's wondered, you just label where it's gone. Maybe a worry, maybe a judgment, some sort of thought. And then just bring it back to your breath. And this may happen once, twice, a thousand times on a meditation. That's okay. This is exercising the meditation muscle, so to speak. Start now extending your awareness from that fairly narrow focus on your breathing to your body as a whole. Bringing your awareness to the whole of your body. Can you notice an area of particular comfort? Can you notice an area of discomfort as well? Start to imagine that you're breathing into your body as though your body is breathing for you, the entire body breathing in and out. And then start to bring your focus once again to just your breath. thoughts will come. Just let them float away if you can. The objective of meditation is to try not to get too tangled up with your thoughts. They'll be there, they may be really strong, but if you can start to cultivate an awareness of your thoughts, then you're developing a sense of yourself, watching your thoughts. And this means that we can sometimes be able to not react to these thoughts and just merely let them go. 
And when you're ready, bring your eyes to an open. Have a little stretch if that feels good. Take a big, deep breath in. And let it go. And that's a simple meditation. There you go. I think that's the first time, uh, Zach, we've done a meditation live on our Lunch and Learns, but it's been great. I've really enjoyed that. The, it's really sort of, really does make you stop and think and just relax and, yeah, you know, sort of gets you ready for what's coming next. That's exactly what that can be used for as well. You can use that after a problem, with a problem, or before you're about to do something. It's just before a meeting, before a presentation. This is what I do before this presentation is I'll do this very short three minute meditation just to become fully present and grounded. And then my intuitive and my practice already then comes out in terms of what I'm gonna talk about rather than worrying it around my head and worrying about what's gonna happen. So hope that was it. If there's any more questions, uh, happy to field any more questions if anyone has any, but. Uh, I've had no more coming while I've been doing the meditation. I hope hopefully people have been meditating with us. So that's uh, it's always a good so. good sign. But um, you know, just going through my mind now, Zach, is if you're if you're in a workplace, there's two or three of you or more, then maybe get a you know get find a time in the diary a couple of times a week when you can sit and do that together as a, as a group. Um, do it with you know support each other or, or do it on your own. But um, a great way just to help re-energize, I think, and sort of you know be, stay focused on on yourself in being, being present. And I've really enjoyed having you with us today, Zach. You know, we talked a bit about how we can over, 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 reduce overwhelming stress. And as I said, looking at our nourishing and our depleting activities and be reviewing mine and uh, improving our focus. I've really, really enjoyed that mindfulness and that meditation. So thank you so much for joining us. Uh, Zach, before we finish, if people want to find out more, you mentioned the courses that you run. Do you want to tell us a bit more about those? Oh, sure, yeah. So um, obviously well-being in your office is designed for businesses, but um, I'll put some details in the chat, actually. But we obviously we also offer services to individuals as well, because um, not all businesses will be investing in this. So if you are interested as an individual, um, we have another side to our business, which is called Wellbeing in Your Home. And we have drop in classes for yoga and mindfulness. And I also run eight week courses as well for people that want to really transform their lives and be really fully focused and reduce their anxiety. But you can find it on the website. I've put some details in the chat um, and both websites have links to both websites. So uh, by all means, have a little look around and see what you like and, and get in contact. I'll be happy to have a chat with you um, about anything you might want to talk about regarding what we do. Perfect. Thank you so much, Zach. And uh, what I'll make sure I do is I've got those details here. I'll make sure I add those to the, the feeds on both LinkedIn and Facebook. So if you're watching us there, we'll make sure we, we transfer those details uh, so you can click on those links as well and find out more about mindfulness, both at work and, and in the home and how you can access uh, working with Zach at Wellbeing in Your Office. So thank you so much. It's been great having you with us, Zach. We look forward to our listeners joining us again on Monday for our next Lunch and Learn. And uh, as I say, do reach out to, to Zach and, and his colleagues um, if you found today really useful. And if nothing else, come back and listen to it again in, in maybe a couple of hours time and just zoom into that last, last section, those last five minutes where you can do another mindfulness session with us. But do reach out to Zach. And uh, I hope that today has really helped you to think about how you're structuring your day and how you can really um, retain, retain that focus, and improve your focus on the work that you've got ahead of you this week. But Zach, thank you so much. Look forward to welcoming you back again sometime in the future. Thanks for having and, me, Steve. Uh, I really uh, appreciate it. No problem at all. And to all our listeners, have a great uh, day. You're over, over the halfway point now for the week. Uh, make the most of today and enjoy Thursday and Friday. And we look forward to catching up with you again on Monday. But for now, stay well and stay safe. Thank you, Zach. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.